Hello, my name is Michael Downey, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the third AWRI webinar for the 2018-19 program. This week's session will take a look at anti-transparents and what role they may be able to play in helping to combat compressed harvests through manipulation of ripening. Now, I'd also like to thank and acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for AWRI webinars. For those of you just joining us, welcome. Today's topic is anti-transparents. Can they enhance wine grape production? And it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's session, Darren Farr. Darren Fahey, apologies, Darren. Darren is a viticulture development officer with New South Wales DPI and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in developing products and systems that improve the overall profitability and sustainability of the wine industry. Over to you, Darren. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, pleased to be here today and happy to present on the work that I've been doing on anti-transparents over the last couple of years. Um, I suppose just some quick background. Um, 2016-17 was the first year on pin and wire on uh, pin and wire grapes on two sites and then um, uh, this year or the vintage just gone 2017-18 we extended that out to include seven new Shiraz sites uh, across New South Wales. So just getting into it in recent years a warming trend has resulted in earlier more compressed vintages impacting on winery logistics and result in wines with higher alcohol. The aim of this work is to test the anti-transparent vapour guard in controlled and filled conditions to see if the treatment could manipulate grape production with no detrimental impact on yield, grape and wine quality. Uh, for those of you that, that don't know any transparents, uh, vapour guard is just one of them. Uh, it's a water emulsifiable concentrate, uh, terpenic polymer produced from pine or conifer resin. Uh, the vapour guard products uh, sold through AgSpec in South Australia is now relabeled under the product name Stress X, uh, but it also that active constituent, uh, the D1 polymethane, uh, comes in a variety of different uh, label names. So it's a, still the same active, it may have a different dye within it, um, but that product has been since relabeled. Uh, the reason we used Vapor Guard and, and not other products is some Italian researchers recently, uh, such as uh, Gaddy and Paolotti, um, studied any transference uh, on Barbera and and also uh, Sangiovese uh, after observing a uh, trend in early grape ripening. Their study across two vintages found when any transparents were applied at pre-varaison or in combination with a pre-flowering spray, sugar accumulation was slowed without any impact on the accumulation of anthocyanins. Uh, with some trial work of any transparents has taken place in conjunction with sunscreen products, little published data exists on their use in wine grapes in an Australian context. So we're looking at um, filling a bit of a void in that space in the research. If we have a look at this slide produced some time ago uh, through GWRDC, um, if we think of water relations in wine grapes, it's between fruit set and harvest where over 70% of the annual water for vines is required during a season. It, it, not necessarily when people may apply, but um, that's the uh, annual percentage of water required inside that box. Uh, if we take that into consideration uh, with transpiration during that growing period, um, vapour guard or anti-transference may assist in maintaining that berry and leaf integrity, or it could go the opposite way and increase berry and leaf temperature because uh, we're going against you know, the main principles of horticulture where you've got a, essentially a plumbing system from the roots up to the airspace where water is being dragged through the plant and expelled to cool the plant down. So let's just have a look and see what we could be doing by changing 
the impacts to our our vines with the use of antitransference. So where should antitransference be applied in this study? We wanted to see if the polymer being sprayed on was acting as a physical barrier or actually closing the stomata, in which case we would need to apply it to the lower surface of the leaf, given that that is where stomata are located. This is easier to achieve in the lab and less so in the field. So Suji Brajers, a uh, colleague of mine at NWGIC, um, took on some experiments in the lab uh, to see what the results would be. So in this slide, we can see transpiration on the left and uh, photosynthesis on the right. And we have a control on the far left and it's where we've covered the upper surface, the lower surface and both surfaces of the leaf. And in this particular uh, study, we put 2% of vapor guard was painted on the upper, lower and both leaf surfaces to better understand which was most effective. Leaf transpiration or water loss was not significantly reduced when applied to the upper surface of the leaf, but when applied to the lower surface, transpiration was significantly lowered. Painting both surfaces reduced transpiration slightly more than only the lower surface, but this was not significant. Similar results occurred in regard to photosynthesis on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. So looking at stomatal conductance, in reduction, the reduction in transpiration and net assimilation was a direct effect of reduced stomatal conductance. However, the cryosam image that we see on the left-hand side revealed that the antitransparent did not alter stomatal guard cell function, since stomatal aperture was not reduced in response to the treatment. Stomatal conductance was thus reduced simply by blocking or the blockage of the pores it's themselves. So we can see that the stomatal cavity width and length, no significant difference, and when combined, no significant difference. And we're also on the right-hand side, it's just um, it, it, uh, the same situation as that uh, stomatal conductance slide before where we've got lower surface or both surfaces are providing us with that lower levels. In order to assess how effective vapor guard is across a, a range of temperatures, potted vines were sprayed with 1% vapor guard and 10 days later they were moved into controlled environment chambers where the temperature was increased from 20 to 35 degrees over a four day period. And we carried out our assessments at those times. But just prior to moving the vines into the chambers, we had several heavy rain events and we're worried that vapor guard may have lost some of its efficacy so we applied two additional treatments uh, to those vines before moving them into the cabinets. And these were the 1% dip and 2% dip. So you can see control in black, 1% spray uh, we, that was rain affected in the blue and then the one and 2% dipped. So we're, we're, we're selecting in, uh, replicates of individual leaves just to assess for these two parameters of transpiration and photosynthesis. The 1% spray was effective at reducing leaf photosynthesis, transpiration and stomatal conductance at 20, 25, 30 and 35 degrees, despite several intervening rain events when sprayed and measured. A 1% treatment on the morning prior to measurement was however more effective across this temperature range, showing that the, the rain did reduce the efficacy of the vapor guard to some extent. The 2% vapor guard did not provide any significant additional benefit to the 1% uh, treatment. Um, compared to untreated leaves, the 1% vapor guard reduced transpiration uh, by 30% at the 35 degree uh, relative to the untreated leaves. So it's working at 35 uh, the best, uh, sorry, at 30 degrees the best, but also effective at 35 degrees. So this is just um, untreated berries in this slide, um, going from peppercorn on the on the left hand side all the way out to 25 degree bricks, just to see what the percentage weight loss per hour is in just uncovered untreated berries. 
So it was obvious that the vapor guard had an effect on the leaves, but we also wanted to know at this point, um, could we reduce the transpiration of the bunches themselves? And this practical information would shed light on what part of the canopy to target when spraying. So as I said, these are our, our untreated bunches, and you can see that over time, whether it's peppercorn out to 25 degree bricks, uh, there's certainly a, a reduction in loss of um, transpiration or moisture loss per hour uh, as we go throughout the season. However, we wanted to see if um, transpiration could be reduced even further with vapor guard. So the following slides is, is what that information will show. So here we are at fruit set. And so the control is the nil on the left, nil percent vapor guard. And then we've gone out from a quarter of a percent, half a percent, one and two as we go to the right. And we're looking at percentage weight loss per hour. And we found that vapor guard was effective at all stages of development. And at the fruit set stage, 2% was significantly more effective than 1% anti-transparent treatment. If we look at peppercorn pea size and veraison, the rest of the stages, we went up to 3% uh, for these assessments. I think that photo on the left is fairly clear of the retention or the less uh, desic uh, desiccation of that, those um, plant parts that are removed. Uh, at the peppercorn stage, 2% vapor guard, half the rate of weight loss relative to the control, uh, but 3% did not provide any further protection. At the pea size stage, neither two or 3% was more effective, uh, but at Verizon, 3% was more effective. So we've got some differences happening across those different stages. So what concentration is most effective at 25, uh, 20 and 25 degree bricks? One and 2% were effective at reducing weight loss at 20 degrees bricks, as well as at 25. Um, the 3% was not able to curb weight loss significantly more than 2% at 25 degree bricks. The product had an effect on both the rachis and berries as evidenced by the retention. Here we're looking at water content, so percentage water content, not loss per hour uh, from both these components. And you can see all of the solution rates uh, significantly um, increased in maintaining percentage water content. Just as in humans, transpiration in plants has the beneficial effects of cooling, which I mentioned earlier. When we reduce the ability of a leaf or a berry to transpire by coating it with a film, we may be resulting in significant tissue heating, which may be also detrimental to fruit composition. So we had a look at temperatures. And so we assess the effects of vapor guard on berry temperature under uniform illumination and little air turbulence and found that that berries were 12 to 13 degrees warmer than the air temperature at 23.8. Berries treated with the 2% vapor guard were a further 0.9 uh, degree warmer relative to the untreated berries. And this may or may not be significant considering the more than greater 10 degrees rise in the control berries anyway. And finally, um, we wanted to have a look at does it induce any fruit abortion and what was happening around the flowering stage. 1% vapor guard did not alter the onset of flowering or fruit set. Six days after spraying, the inflorescence had attained 83% um, uh, cap ball with the control inflor uh, inflorescences had attained 87. Um, 11 days after spraying, the proportion of inflorescences had reached the fruit stage Fruit set stage was, were also not altered in the spray and vines compared to the control. Um, and 1% vapor guard did not induce any fruit abortion as there was no fruit abortion in either of the treatments. So no significant differences there, no issues around uh, flowering and fruit set. So 
So just to summarise the controlled uh, environment studies, uh, one percent um, or any transplants reduce transpiration of leaves and bunches, and one percent is very effective. On leaves, it's most effective at 30 degrees temperature, but also very effective at 35. It has to be applied to the lower surface of the leaves to be affected, effective. We lost some effectiveness of the treatment after rainfall. Uh, it did not promote any fruit abortion and increases to bunch temperature were only slight. So I'm going to move on now and talk about our field trials. So fully randomised, replicated, complete block trial design was established across nine separate sites and seven wine regions on Pinot and Shiraz wine grapes. Uh, the 2017-18 would be the second year of the study for the Pinot sites and the first year for Shiraz. Landholders pruned vines to uniformity and vine balance prior to the season commencing with all ongoing management throughout the vintage undertaken equally across the entire trial block and no landholder uh, was asked to reduce any irrigations. Uh, this is the applications were put on according to the label rates using a 15 litre, four megapascal pressurised backpack spray unit. Vapor guard treatments were applied on visual assessment at pre-flowering, pre veraison and a combined treatment of both pre-flowering and pre veraison This was uh, to couple up with what the Italians were researching. So we stayed in line with their trial design to see if our results were comparable. However, those previous field trial um, carried out in Italy used solution rates of 2 and 3% on Barbera and Sangiovese. Our study, we went for a 1% solution rate and was doing this so we could look at the economics for, for growers, not just the scientific results. So just to have a look at the site information, we've got a myriad of things happening here. Um, we're dealing with a mixture of soil types and clones of varying ages. And also the hilltop Pinot Noir site was dry land in comparison to all others, which were drip irrigated. Um, we also had, uh, with Pinot, we also had um, cane pruning and uh, gripper sites were box pruned or hedged. And then we've got, um, spur pruning across most of the other Shiraz sites as well. So a lot of different things going on there. When it came to uh, the 17, 18 um, seasonal growing conditions, other than Canberra, um, all trial sites were down on vintage rainfall against the long-term means. Um, and when it comes to mean maximum temperatures, we're up around two degrees across all the sites, uh, demonstrating what most people would remember out of 2017 as a dry, hot season experienced across most of New South Wales wine growing regions. Canberra's uh, rainfall, really, that last um, little burst was just prior to harvest, um, where they received around 40 or 50 mils to, to increase it above that long term mean. So we're going to have a look at some um, trial data now. Uh, there's a lot to get through, so um, bear with me. Hi, oh, Darren. Sorry to interrupt you there for a moment. Um, you may have actually mentioned this earlier, but can you confirm, was the control treatment uh, a water spring? No, control, control treatment was um, uh, nothing added. Okay, great. So no, just, just normal management. Right. Thanks for confirming. All right, just having a look at berry weights here. So this is a, um, a sample of 100 berries collected off 20 bunches from each replicate and then the means gathered and statistically analysed. Um, the significant difference resulted in mean berry weights across sites. Um, uh, A's um, are seen as, the, um, as where we've got significant difference to um, the greater point. Um, at site one in Griffith, all vapor guard treatments were equally increased above the, above the control. Uh, whereas on other Shiraz sites, the pre on and the dual treatment of pre-flowering pre on result in the greatest berry weight increases. Uh, we've got berry weight increases there across um, six of those nine sites.
when we look at uh, bunch weights uh, across the same sites, the very, very weight results carried over in a higher bunch weights at most sites in mainly the pre varazon and the dual application treatments. However, two sites where berry weight was significantly in increased at Hilltops, Pinamoir and the Griffiths site, one, uh, they did not uh, result in increase in bunch weights and two sites where berry weight was not increased resulted in higher bunch weights at Canberra and Mudgee. So we had a bit of a flip around on some of the results. Um, but overall, we've got bunch weight increases at seven of the, of the nine sites. And looking at the, at the data, uh, it's mainly in that pre varazon on the later spray and the, and the dual treatment. Pre-flowering doesn't seem to have as much impact. And that's shown through in the yield results where we've got uh, seven of the nine sites increased in yield and where yield was significantly increased with vapor guard above the control increases range from 18 to 30 percent with site three at orange uh, resulting in the highest percentage increase across all sites interesting to note um, the when we presented this data in griffith just recently some of the growers were a bit put off with some of the yield results there and uh, I'm yet to present in Canberra and show them uh, where they're at with their yield, but it, it's possibly a, another impact from that 40, 50 mils right at the end of the season when they had no rain for the rest part. I just did some quick numbers looking at return on investment. If you're going to uh, undertake this work um, from a grower's perspective, so if we extrapolate out, out the yield figures across all uh, hectares and, and we take in some known costs and return values, we can calculate that VaporGuard gives us a return on investment and the site that gave us the best return on investment above the control after all costs was Canberra. Um, so it, it, yeah, they're getting good returns on their grapes, but also where we put the applications on uh, and pre on and the dual treatment. Um, the, the tons differences against the control. Um, that's where we get our get our figures from. But if we were to go to Griffith, um, probably the the worst of the performing sites. Uh, if we look and take undertake the same analysis, uh, the single treatment at pre on gives us a positive return, whereas the dual treatment at this great price uh, does not provide a return. In fact, we're going backwards by applying this treatment. Um, so I wouldn't find uh, this sort of figures that anyone would be interested for this particular region. Uh, several interactions though can easily change this outcome from increased yield or higher grape prices or lower costs. Uh, if the grape price was 600 though, um, a return would be achieved under the dual treatment. Uh, so I found $600 uh, grape price as the, as the factor for all sites, regardless of that yield return. Uh, getting into some great quality data now because uh, we want to see you know, yields one thing but we want to see what what this product does to um, grape and wine if we look at the bricks readings of all the sites two sites result in a significant reduction where vapor guard was applied at a dual treatment in orange and site two in griffith over the pre on treatment at hilltop shiraz site the tumbarumba uh, at hilltop shiraz site and the tumbarumba pino site both the pre on and dual treatment were equally reduced below the control and pre-flowering treatments. The impact of pre-flowering application on bricks seems negligible uh, from these results. And one other point to note is that two sites where fruit came from to make the experimental wines, which is Griffith site, two Shiraz and the Tumbarumba Pinot Pinot Noir site, uh, they were significantly lower in bricks when testing the 100 berry sample. So we'll see if that carries through into the wine side. If we look at anthocyanins across all sites in a year that was uh, warm and dry, uh, people were having difficulty uh, achieving colours anyway. Um, very little differences resulted, um, uh, although we did have three of the nine sites recording equally significant reductions in anthocyanins. Uh, with the pre on and the dual treatment. 
uh, equally below uh, pre-flowering and controls. Interestingly, the, ma the majority of the Shiraz sites uh, trended lower in, in both those treatments with VapoGuard than the control. Uh, however, the both Pinot Noir sites are trending upwards uh, the opposite way with increases uh, above the control in those same treatments. So is it like what the Italians had in San Giovese was decreased and um, Barbera was increased? We're getting a flip of that. We're getting Shiraz going backwards and Pinot Noir going up. So something to look at there if it's variety specific. Um, Interestingly as well, no total phenolic differences between any treatments across any of the trial sites. And we had very small differences, um, not enough to report on in this presentation with pH and TA differences, regardless of treatment across the sites. Just looking at um, some data I got only just this week of uh, Pinot Noir wine that uh, was experimentally made at NWGIC and triplicate reps off each treatment uh, from the fruit supplied off the trial area. Uh, the Tumbarumba Pinot results indicate significant differences in TA uh, and both with both the um, pre on and dual treatment reduced uh, in wine TA below the control and pre-flowering, albeit all wines are still above five grams um, per litre. And the pre on the vapor guard treatment resulted in a high level of acetic acid in context. Um, this is close to the mean of 0 0.40 grams per litre that the AWRI commercial services laboratory found uh, from 277 Australian wines as reported by Eric Wilkes in 2016. So um, presented this in the Hunter yesterday and there wasn't really any real considerations about that being an, an issue. Uh, the trend in alcohol down carried over with the um, alcohol volume um, in this, but wasn't significantly significantly different, just missed out by a very small amount. When it comes to the Shiraz, um, just where we did get some differences in the wine, uh, we had a significant increase in pH at uh, site two in Griffith across um, all vapor guard treatments uh, with the highest increase in the dual treatment. However, in context, all these wines are still well below 3.6 pH units. Uh, in alcohol, the lower alcohol percentages uh, in wine resulted in all vapor guard treatments below the control with the pre on and dual treatments equally recording the lowest alcohol levels. Um, BRICS levels in these berries, as I said before, at harvest were significantly lower in those treatments um, compared to the control at the same site. And this outcome is encouraged if we're thinking about the production of lower alcohol wines or if vintage compression continues, growers may be able to ripen their fruit under lower, con cooler conditions. But um, it's, it, it, I would have liked to maybe have seen this at a greater level, but um, who knows, we'll, we'll see if we, we go again this year. Acetic acid uh, was also significantly increased in the dual treatment. Uh, interestingly, the pre on went below both the control and the pre-flowering. So this may be just a, um, a winemaking, um, in the experimental winemaking side of things, uh, more so than a negative uh, assessment of uh, the treatment. Um, we'll keep our eye on acetic acid, albeit well, we're under that 0 0.40 grams per litre, as I said before, that Eric Wilkes uh, published. So in summary of our field results, we significantly increased yield at seven of the nine sites. We significantly reduced bricks at four of the nine sites. Um, we also significantly reduced anthocyanins at three of the nine sites. Uh, the effect on anthocyanins may be varietal specific and there may be a potential to create low alcohol wines in the vineyard. The future directions um, with this work is um, we've got some sensory evaluation to do of the wines. Uh, we did hold a tasting of the control, the pre-varaison and the dual treatment in the Hunter Valley yesterday and just got a show of hands. There was 
a mixed uh, reaction to the control and the dual treatment, um, roughly around 10 sets of hands for each um, and about four sitting in the middle. Um, this wasn't to get any data at this particular point. It was just to see if people actually could pick up uh, any sort of pine characters or resin type characters. Um, and, and there was no negative feedback from an audience of a room full of some experienced winemakers out of the hunter. But yeah, look, we've got full on sensory to do. And that's just because some of these wines are only recently been finished and put in bottles. So we've got some time to deal with that. Uh, there is the chance to do a second year of data on the Shiraz sites. We probably wouldn't continue with the Pinot because we've got two years of data now. Um, we also are thinking about looking at white wine varieties um, and also reduced irrigation uh, inputs, um, probably thinking around 20% to maintain the same type of yield. So there might be a cost saving there and an environmental saving there for, for, for growers. And also thinking about separating out um, the spray applications and, and just sticking to the leaf and or bunch or both and, and seeing where we go with that. And Susie and I both have papers um, put together and one's just about to be accepted by ASBO, I believe. So we're on the way to get some of the work published. All this work wouldn't happen without the help of others. So I acknowledge uh, the funding provided by New South Wales DPI skills development program and originally the Pinot Noir trial um, was kicked off with regional program uh, funding out of Wine Australia and um, yeah we didn't really know what we were stumbling on there but um, it ended up being bigger than Ben Hur for 2017-18 and maybe next year could be bigger again. Uh, the contributors uh, from all the different regions, um, some of the names people may know, and also Casella and Kurabira for um, supplying the grapes um, for us to make those wines. And some of our staff on hand, Adrian Englefield or um, Gavaro Campbell Meeks and Oscar Malik at NWGIC for all their help with um, harvesting, data collection and experimental winemaking. So that's it for me. I'm happy to take some questions, Michael. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Darren, uh, for a very informative presentation there. Uh, some really interesting results. Um, as Darren has indicated, he is gonna stick around and um, answer any questions that you may have. So please start sending any queries you have through now. Um, just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, just open the Q&A section of, on your webinar toolbar and type your, set, your questions in and send them through. Uh, while we're waiting to see if we have any further questions, um, I'll just remind our audience about the next AWRI webinar. Uh, it's going to be held on Thursday, the 27th of September. Uh, and we'll have Wine Australia's Kirsten Hannan providing insight into global supply and demand trends and how these affect Australian wine. Uh, while also looking at the state of play regarding some of the um, key export markets for, um, for Australia. Okay, I can see a question in through um, uh, one of the um, attendees, Michael. Yeah, go ahead and read that out if you want, if you're happy to answer that one, Darren. Um, okay, I've got um, a question from Marty Longbottom. Uh, it occurred that many of the differences you have seen are unlikely to have positive economic significance except yield, reduced colour may be negative. Could you speak? Um, to the original aims of using any transparency yeah look marty uh, happy to answer that and it, it does somewhat fly against what i was you know, thinking or hoping maybe but uh, you never know what you get until you do the work uh, i i think there there may be the factor of the application so as i said targeting um just leaves instead of 
bunches. Um, I think I probably, I didn't, you know, favour spraying bunches, but um, I, I think I could favour spraying leaves more um, next time and, and probably come up with a, a different result, but we'd also come up with a different result regardless because of the seasonal differences. So in essence, let's see if partitioning out the spray somewhat may make a difference there. I hope that answers your question, Marty. I've got I've got another question, Michael. Yeah, go ahead, Darren. Um, I've got good? one from Brian Nitsch Shinks, by the looks of that. Um, hope I've pronounced that right, Brian. Um, do you consider the question is Do you consider this will have an advantage for cool climate vineyard in the drier in the drier 2017-18 for Tumba Rumba, which I would consider cool climate? Um, it, it, it did increase um, our yields and had some differences there associated to it. I, I'd see it probably being more suitable for um, you know, warmer, drier uh, situations. Um, and just to give people some information as well, I, I put some temperature sensors in to gauge not only soil temp, but canopy temperatures across the Griffith site. Uh, one of the group of sites and we logged um, temperatures above 35 degrees. Uh, the control temperatures um, were 197 hours spent above 35 degrees for this growing season. Um, whereas the dual treatment spent 221. So a, a one day extra over 35. So with that berry and leaf temperature increase that we noticed in the lab, um, it did go on, um, albeit that uh, we're not looking at replicated um, leaf temperature sensors. These were just single sensors. So uh, one point in time, just to gauge that, um, just to let people know that um, there was a increase in temperatures um, for those particular vines. Okay, great. Thanks for going through those couple of questions there, Darren. And thanks also to Brian and Marty for shooting those through. Um, looks like that might be it with regard to the Q&A side of things. Darren, did you have anything final you wanted to add before we, we start to wrap up? Uh, no, look, I, well, I suppose, yes, I do. Um, Go for it. At, at, at the end of the day, um, Yes, there's a whole lot of different products out there um, for, for the potential to manipulate um, wine grapes. Uh, some of them haven't been explored yet. So this, this is only early work and we would like to see how it would potentially go on whites where we don't have to worry about the colours um, to any extent. So it may have the potential um, for other um, for white varieties more so than reds. And I think that might answer Marty's question a little bit more succinctly. Okay, great. So certainly a watch this space topic and um, it'd be interesting to see some of those sensory evaluation, evaluation results once they're um, available too, Darren. Happy to come back again if people are interested. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you to Darren, um, especially given he's travelling at the moment. Um, it's been very interesting content. Um, I hope audiences found it uh, informative. I'd also like to thank the audience for participating in today's session. Um, all attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the next AWRI webinar is on the 27th of September. Um, details are on your screen now. Um, if you'd like to register for this webinar, please visit the AWRI website. That's all for today. Thank you again for participating and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.